Mandatory minicamp coming up tomorrow. Ben Raven from MLive.com covers the Lions. is going to join us today here on a Monday. Locked on Lions. You are locked on Lions. Your daily Detroit Lions podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. And what's good, everybody? Matt Derry with you. It is a Monday edition of Locked On Lions right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Monday, June 5th into Tuesday, June 6th. Thanks for listening, making us your first listen, and checking us out wherever you get your podcast. Big day tomorrow as the Lions open up mandatory minicamp. That means everybody's got to be there. Real practices, seven-on-sevens. Everything is full bore for tomorrow. We'll talk to Benjamin Raven, who covers the Lions for MLive.com, kind of a Co-beat writer with Kyle Mikey. We love Kyle. We love Ben. Ben also co-hosts the Dungeon of Doom podcast with Kyle. Ben's going to join us coming up momentarily right here on Locked On Lions. Again, thanks for making us your first listen, checking us out wherever you get your podcasts, following us on Twitter at Dairy Speaks, at Locked On Lions on Twitter, the Matt Dairy Facebook fan page, and as always, watching. Hello to all of you watching on our Locked On Lions YouTube channel free, and you can subscribe as well on the YouTube channel. Shout out to our everydayers, some of you that listen each and every day on the show, like Johnny Mack and the D, uh, Jay DeSanza, Jeremy Girardi, Adam Sieri over in Australia. Thanks, Adam. Arthur Melkor and more. Thanks to some of our everydayers that are with us each and every day. Uh, before we get Ben on the show, there was a report in the athletic.com today by Kalen Kaler, who's really been all over the uh, betting and gambling suspensions across the NFL. And it said that she basically interviewed five unnamed players in the NFL, just five, not anybody that had anything to do with gambling around the league and the betting on sports and the suspensions. And they all said that they were not informed of the rule very clearly. And that many of these players agree that Jamison Williams kind of got a raw deal because as a young player, he didn't know you couldn't bet on other sports within the facility. And so it kind of gives some credence to, hey, listen, the league and the teams need to do a better job of telling the players, of, of, of vocalizing it, that, yeah, look, you know, yes, we're brought to you by FanDuel, and yes, there are some sports books inside some stadiums. But no, you cannot bet on the NFL, period, no matter what. And you can't bet on other sports on these sites if you're at the team facility or at the stadium. And, of course, Jamison Williams got popped for six games for betting on other sports within the Allen Park facility. My thing is this. You want to keep putting out these reports. You want to still hear from unnamed players saying, we didn't know the rules, and it's not real clear. Why is it that there's only been about a handful of suspensions, seven or eight suspensions, and that's been it? No one else has been caught yet. Now, I understand there's a second wave coming. There's a report today that a Colts player, Bet on his own team. I was betting on the NFL, and he'll be suspended for a year if that if that investigation comes to fruition. The Lions didn't do a very good job with this. Jameson Williams didn't do a very good job. Cephas, C.J. Moore, all of these guys that got suspended. There were enough players that knew not to, right, within the confines of the facility and everything else if it was non-NFL. So it's not like there's been hundreds of these suspensions. It's been below 10. So... I know J-Mo is young. He's going to learn from this, hopefully bounce back, and by week seven is a major contributor here. But let's not, you know, all of a sudden just say all these guys are innocent because the league and the teams didn't do their job. You got to know and you got to ask. So um, that's where I stand on it. All right, Ben Raven is uh, coming up next. Today's broadcast of Locked On Lines is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. NBA playoffs, now we're getting interesting. Heat and Nuggets are now tied at one. How about Miami with a big road win in Denver last night? You have the Tigers playing the Phillies in Interleague this week. You want to bet on all the action? Go to America's number one sports book, FanDuel. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Go there right now. Get that no sweat first bet up to $1,000. FanDuel's the best. They got everything you want there. If you like betting on games, it's easy to use. The app is free. It's safe, it's secure, super easy to use. Just go to fanduel.com slash locked on, 
Sign up that way, and uh, you're off and running with FanDuel. Make every moment more with FanDuel. Always a pleasure to welcome in Ben Raven from MLive.com, one of the uh, beat writers for the Lions, of course, with Kyle Mikey and the co-host of the Dungeon of Doom podcast. Minicamp, mandatory minicamp start tomorrow. <laughs> Want to get Ben on today to get into it a little bit. What's up, sir? Not too much, not too much. Uh, fresh back from the West Coast, got in at uh, 2 in the morning, so we're uh, we're back in the real world, but ready to get to the <laughs> <big> camp. <laughs> Did you have a good time out there? What was the, what was the big highlight for you? Uh, oh, fantastic time. Uh, actually celebrating my dad and my girlfriend's birthday. They shared the same birthday, had a barbecue. We took a train ride through the Royal Gorge and took some beautiful drives and stuff like that. Checked out the Air Force Academy, checked out CU Boulder, where my girlfriend went, just kind of a good sightseeing and family trip. I haven't, I don't think I've been on a trip with my parents in about 16, 17 years. So it was pretty nice. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Well, she's going to be, she's got, I don't know how big of a football fan is dating you, but <laughs> not now if you're a Colorado Buffalo alum, right? You're on the bandwagon now that uh, coach prime is there, right? That's right. I, I bought a prime CU shirt while I was on campus too. Yes. I had to, I saw it, but I, I kind of was letting her know. I'm like, you know, this is going to be the most relevant they've been in about 25 years. So buckle <laughs> in. <laughs> yeah. No question about it. All right, speaking of relevant, obviously the Lions are, are the talk of the town, even you know, e even with kind of out of season. But mini camp coming up, uh, Ben. What are you looking forward to, uh, kind of seeing the next few days? You know, the next few days, it's kind of like watching the new coaches and how they operate. But mainly, it's like Jamison Williams and how that chemistry is building with Jared Goff and just kind of how he continues to progress through his kind of interesting trajectory since landing around these parts and. Uh, you know, mini camp is always a little interesting, you know, mandatory mini camp. So you're taking attendance the first day pretty hardcore. And then, uh, yeah, just looking to see how they continue to go, looking how they how they continue to use Jameer Gibbs, how they continue to use Sam Laporta. Like, as we noted on our pod a couple of weeks ago, like there were a lot more two running back looks on the field at the same time. And they did not do that much at all last year. And you think that they would with like a pass catching back like Swift and a short yardage guy like Williams. But it really didn't happen that much. But. I think we're going to see that a lot more. And so I'm going to keep looking for that because I think Ben Johnson is really just kind of, it feels like he's got a new page he's going to show this year, just kind of with some of these pieces that they've added a lot of versatility. You mentioned Jamison Williams, and I want to ask about the gambling thing in a second, but yeah. on the field, seems like he's looked pretty good in some of these OTAs and the, the workouts, but how much pressure do you think he feels? Because really everything else is just so smooth sailing and he's kind of the, the rocky part of the ship. Yeah, I, I think he's probably feeling a little bit of pressure just because, I mean, this was supposed – I mean, it was set up perfectly for him. It was, I mean, perfect. Redshirt season, he got to play a little last year. That wasn't expected of him. Brad Holmes has said multiple times that he had no expectations for him to play or not last year. Coming to this season, I mean, ah. So he's got to be feeling the pressure because, I mean, you've basically burned a year and a half of that rookie contract. You've burned a year and a half of your first two seasons of the league, but – um. Yeah, the last time I saw him, I was not at uh, the OTA last week, and I, I saw the highlights, and I heard that he made a couple of nice plays. I mean, obviously, any any play like that is good, but I just – the drops, he's got to got to kind of clean up the drops in practice. I remember what the thing that's really stuck out to me was, like, Nate Sudfeld just had a beautiful, beautiful deep bomb for him, and it was like one of those plays, and over the shoulder, Deshaun Jackson-style play that you expect him to make in the end zone because he's burned the two defenders that were responsible for handling him, and he didn't handle it. So it's like – does it matter? No. Am I concerned about him? No. He's an ultra talented guy with just traits that you can't teach, but like you got to get going. It's got to get yeah. going. You got to get it cleaned up off the field and you got to, you got to play. You got to be available. I mean, that's, this was a step backwards. I mean, now he's got getting questions about Lamar Jackson and Instagram likes every time he steps to the podium and there's just so much noise. And it's just like, he's the only facet of this team where kind of, there's a lot of noise. Negative his so, noise. His social is. media yeah. is interesting. Um, <laughs> it is interesting. <laughs> yeah, and it's not something that, you know, I just hear from so many fans, and I, I know you do as well, especially with social media now. It's just like, oh, did you see what he posted at 3 a.m. or <laughs> handing out cash to kids in the middle of Detroit for no reason and filming that, uh, going to the, the, the boxing match out in Vegas, you know, hours after he was suspended, which, you know, you'd figured you'd lay low. Do you think it's just immaturity? And do you also think a guy like Marvin Jones is going to be so key because maybe Marvin takes him under his wing and says, you know, clean it up, cut it out, stick with me. And that's a guy that, that could really mentor. I do think it's immaturity. I really do. He had the one big season at Alabama. He's had like 
12 and a half to 14 weeks in the spotlight, you know, and that was at the college level. And now it's just, it's all new. I think, you know, I, I don't think he was ever expecting to be asked about his Instagram likes and stuff like that, but you bring up a good point because every time I get a notification that Jameson <laughs> Williams is going live, it's usually after two 30 in the morning, no matter what day it is. So I just, I think he's 22 years old. You know, this is still new to him. I, I think he's very, very immature, not in a bad way. I mean, obviously some parts of it are bad with the gambling suspension, but I do think he's just a kid. And I mean, you hope someone like Marvin Jones. I mean, it's interesting that you say that because the majority of the questions I've been getting lately through we have this new texting service on MLive called Subtext. People just been asking, like, is there anybody taking him under his wing? And I'm just like, well, Marvin Jones is sitting right there. We haven't seen any of that yet. But like, you couldn't ask for a better kind of just like rock solid role model for someone. So, I mean, it's right there. Just, you know, he's got to take advantage of it. Ben Raven with us, covers Alliance for MLive.com, along with our buddy Kyle Meinke, uh, best beards and facial hair for <laughs> covering anybody in the business uh, in any sport. Uh, ben and Kyle do a great job. Thanks. One more thing on, on JMO. So now it seems like Lion players, including Kirby Joseph last week with the free JMO shirt, now there's been some reports out there, the Athletics saying, well, NFL players are now coming to JMO's defense saying they didn't know about these gambling rules. There's a report today of an unnamed Colts player that yeah. might have been betting on on the, the, his own team, and he would be kicked off the team. But do you – you're down there. Are these guys being told? Are they being reminded? Was it enough that this is something they cannot do despite the fact that they're brought to you by FanDuel? Yeah, no, I, I – and Dan Campbell did say there's a reemphasis. Like, obviously, we got to reeducate, put more of a spotlight that was on us. Yes, we told them what they should, could – and can't do with this but like obviously that message didn't get through to everybody I, I i'm not surprised by it at all because it is such a strange rule i i think and as you said as sponsored by FanDuel, i think it just i think the players just assume they could bet on anything if it wasn't the nfl they could bet on it and that is the rule and then you add in that strange little caveat that like it can't be from the team facility i i think they just need to focus on you can't bet on american football like, I, I think it just needs to be something like that because I, I get it. And I feel weird even calling Jamison immature about it. Like, he just made a, a mistake looking over a, an abend addendum B on a bylaw and the NFL rules on gambling, you know? I, I get it. He bet on a non-NFL sport from inside the team facility. That's got to be frustrating. I understand why his teammates are frustrating, and I would be completely frustrated too. But uh, a rule's the rule. So I, I'm not too worried about that. I'm just worried about the lost time with him. That's that's the thing that I'm really starting to get a little concerned about because he needs he needs to play. I mean, that's a year and a half burn on his contract. But, yeah, it's fascinating. They, 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 they've got to clean those rules up. They do, but what I think is is very interesting is that it's not like hundreds of players have been suspended, you no. know? yeah. And I know that in some states it's not legal. I know in Ohio they finally got sports betting up and running in January. But, my goodness, like it just seems like the Lions had the, the biggest problem. <laughs> no, yeah. That, that Colts one sounds pretty bad. It sounds like he placed a lot of bets on his own team. And, like, the people who did that in Detroit are gone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, no question about it. C.J. Moore and, obviously, a Quintez Quintez Cephas. Cephas. What else you mentioned on offense? You know, Ben Johnson has said we can be even better. But mm – -hmm. Uh, the, 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 the Laporta pickup and just drafting of him, and I've seen some of the clips, and I'm sure you have as well. That could be that could be something really, really good, don't you think? Absolutely, I, I've said it time and time again. Sam Laporta is like a perfect tight end slash big slot weapon for Jared Goff. He's so good across the middle of the field. He can gain, gain a little bit of separation on those short to intermediate routes, and he's good with the ball in his hands. I mean, seriously, this is a great – this is what I thought TJ Hawkinson was going to be for Jared Goff. I, I really kind of see a similar role there. I mean, I think Sam Laporta kind of meshes pretty closely to TJ Hawkinson because Hawkinson wasn't the blocker that he kind of was – advertised that he could be and I, i'm not going to expect much out of sam laporta in the blocking department for year one or year two but i think he can be a really intriguing explosive addition to this offense that you're going to see ben johnson kind of move all over the field i mean you already see him out wide you already see him in the big slot you already see him motioning into h back and the tight end and stuff like that i mean he's a really talented guy who's a lot more athletic than people realize. I mean, this was this guy's really good with the ball in his hands after the catch. And I mean, that's great for Jared Goff on those play action crossers, those play action, just kind of short looky routes and stuff like that. I mean, get him in space, get him in the ball, and he can make a play. It's gonna be weird seeing a former uh, <laughs> a former Iowa tight end not just catch it and fall to the ground like TJ did. 
<laughs> and I know he's a good football player, and Minnesota's got a good yeah. one, but you're right, Laporta making more out of out of it after the fact. That was the one thing that I think was was weird always about TJ Hawkinson. Yeah. We'd get oh, it and immediately yeah. go down to the ground, Ben. It was a little strange. <laughs> Absolutely. Outside of that one massive game last year, we had like the 81 yard catch, and yeah. the 56 yard catch. It was like, oh my God, that's what happens when he stays on his feet and doesn't do the hold X possession reception. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No question. Uh, yep. Ben Raven with us from M Live. We come back. I want to ask him about the defense, uh, certain guys, and who might be ready, who might we not see when it comes yep. to a mandatory minicamp over the next three days here on Lockdown Lions. Ben Raven with us from M Live covers the Lions. MLive.com, Dungeon of Doom podcast as well with the, his co-host Kyle Mikey. I defensively, and I brought this up last week. I thought Levi owns Arike was making progress. Now I'm hearing, well, they're hoping he'll be ready for training camp. Um, at what point do they pull the plug on this? You know, I I think that if he doesn't play in some capacity this year that they've got to move on. I think he will get another chance this season. I'm not saying I think he'll play, but I do think he'll get the kind of the full year because why not? You've wrote it this far, but uh, yeah, it's a really touch and go. You know, they've been really, really hesitant to say anything that would lead to any optimism regarding him, but like now they've kind of put it out there. He might be ready for training camp after kind of flirting with the idea. We might see him more. The only thing I've seen him do, he's had his helmet off. He's been with the defensive line. He's been doing some, like, shadow stuff like that. He is moving around. He's jogging around. But, like, Tracy Walker is moving better than him. And Tracy Walker tore his Achilles, like, seven and a half, eight months ago. So, I mean, I don't I don't know. I have, as I've said, I, I don't expect Levi to ever play a game for the Lions again just because I think – I'm not saying I don't think he'll ever play, but I just think the timeline, you know, they're they're in a different stage of the rebuild than, they, than we really expected them to be. They're not just going to kind of – get this guy reps to get them reps when they've kind of rebuilt their defensive line with guys like Pascal and Kaminsky and Bugs and drafting Broderick Martin. You got Aline McNeil. I mean, there's, there's only so many snaps a guy can play. And I mean, basically he's played one season in the last three or four years and he's had chronic back injuries and back issues. And it's just kind of hard to bet on him. But like, Hey, he gets on the field the training cap. That's what Aaron Glenn keeps saying. Got to get him on the field. Then I'll have an idea. I have no idea right now because he's not on the field. You mentioned Tracy Walker before. If you had to put a percentage on where you think he'll be this week, uh, and, and what would you say? Oh, uh, he's uh, he's going to be down this week. Uh, Tracy said that this will be the last time – when we talked to him two weeks ago, he said, this will be the last time you see me running on the sideline. I will be 100% cleared by training camp, and I, I 100% believe him. He wasn't just jogging on the sideline. He was running like a NFL football player, moving around, and he's pretty confident. He had one checkup left with his uh, – with his surgeon and he, he he didn't sound concerned about that at all and usually he takes stuff like that with a grain of salt but like i saw where jeff okuda was with his recovery last year i see where tracy walker in is, is in his recovery this year and it's like yeah that guy's gonna be ready for training camp so that, i mean that's huge news for that defense i would put 98 percent chance on tracy walker being ready for training camp the only reason i leave that two percent is because it, achilles are what they are and emmanuel mosley also a guy that they're easing back in and jerry jacobs is getting uh yeah you know, kind of the, the the reps there. Not a surprise to you, right? No, not at all. Not at all. You know, they, they Jerry's the last man standing in that cornerback room for a reason. I mean, he really does fit what Aaron Glenn wants out of his guys. It's just someone that can go up, be tough, be physical against the run, and, you know, not get destroyed every time in coverage, you know, when they need him. But, yeah, Mosley, that, that one's tougher just because he he's looked a little – I mean, he's got a giant brace on his knee, but he's been out there moving around, kind of doing the Levi routine a little lesser, I'd say. But uh, if Mosley can be on the field by training camp, I mean, I fully expect him to be the second starter and Jerry Jacobs kind of be in that Mike Hughes Okuda role, bouncing around and stuff. Because I, I think we might even see Jerry kind of move inside if they need it. Like, if they ever get in a pinch for somebody, I think they trust him enough. Like, Jerry Jacobs is on this roster for a reason. He's going to get snapped somehow, some way. A lot of edge guys on this team right now, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, including James Houston and then and then some additions here and certainly bringing John Kaminsky back. Do you see a scenario, Ben, where both Oquaras might not be with the team at the start of the year? I, I, I expect them to be on the team just because so many of those edge guys have some inside-outside versatility, like Kaminsky can bounce inside a lot. You'll You'll see that. I, I think Romeo's got such a team-friendly restructured deal that I think he's going to be in this year. And I just – I still think that Julian O'Quar can be something. I mean, he's he's never going to be a superstar or something, but he's got some spark to him, and he's really had some flashes, and that's somebody – and you hate to say that, but, like, if he can stay healthy, you see something there. You, I mean, they – 
they've got a lot of the inside outside beefy edge guys but like they don't have a James Houston light in my opinion and that could be Julian O'Quar I'm not saying he's got that spark but like that's his type of game if they needed it I I think they'll be both there I think O'Quar is good depth the younger O'Quar is good depth I would put Romeo as a lock in my opinion anybody in in the linebacker room you're interested in seeing this week and, and how they progressed I just, I'm, I'm just staring at Jack Campbell. He's like Aiden last year. It's like, this guy is so much bigger than I thought he was going to be. And like, I knew what, I mean, I, I can, I'm a lifelong big 10 football watcher. I knew who Jack Campbell was and what he was about, but he's even more athletic than I thought he was going to be. I mean, he's long, he's tall. I, I just think as he kind of continues to learn the defense and he's got a great guy to lean on, it's an interesting situation because I think they'll use all four of those guys. I mean, they have to, they're all interesting pieces. Like, they'll all be there, but like, I fully expect Jack Campbell to kind of be there training camp looking different. I, I'm fascinated to see kind of how he looks once they really start going in those heavy practices just because, man, he just looks like such a prototypical linebacker with an edge to him. Look, let's be honest. The best competition at, camp, at, at mini camp, kicker. <laughs> yes, I, yeah, I know you that. missed I know you missed the JPR show last week, but, uh, you know, there's Romo that. kids kicking at 60 yards. Riley Patterson for the 15th time. And obviously Badgley, it never seems like grasps the position. It seems like Brad Holmes, Ben wants us to play a guessing game with a kicker. It's been three years and that's, it's kind of where this is again. Yeah. Cause you can't rule out Riley Patterson because for some <laughs> reason they traded a future draft pick for a kicker yes. that might not make <laughs> it through training camp. So that's a fascinating one. I mean, I, I, I never expected them in a million years to trade future future ass, assets for a kicker they already cut. So uh, that's interesting. But yeah, I heard John Parker Romer. I mean, if he's going to consistently hit fifty-five to sixty-yard field goals, like he's got a real chance at that job because we know what Riley Patterson is. He's money from inside of forty-nine or fifty. He's got some playoff experience. We know who he is. He's an accurate kicker, but he's not going to. He's not going to save you at the end of the game if you absolutely can't. You know what I mean? You know he's not that guy. Yeah. Badgley. I, I I like Badgley more than Patterson. I, I, he's got a little more juice in his leg. He's a proven. He's a veteran kicker. He's Badgley's a cool, cool, a cool, a cool cucumber. Excuse me. Like he seems like one of those kickers. You know, kickers are just kind of different. Matt Prater was a different guy. Badgley's kind of got that to him. I, I don't think you can ruffle him. And I kind of look for that in kickers, especially when the competition is what it is. But hey. Parker Romero is going to keep blasting consistently from that deep and he's going to be the guy. Final thing, Ben, how do you, how do you look at the division right now with, with all the weirdness that's gone on and obviously, you know, turnover in green Bay, Minnesota can't do what they did a year ago. You wouldn't think it's tough to win all those close games and come back and win them. And I know there's some people that love the bears and some like me that aren't buying it yet, but how, how do you kind of view it? I'm, I'm with you on the bears. I think, they'll take some steps forward this year, but I don't think that's anything better than a four or five win team. Again, you know, they've still got a lot of, lot of room to grow, but I, it's a three team division. I mean, unless Jordan love is an absolute disaster, the Packers are going to be there. I mean, that defense might have eight first round starters on it. That's a legit defense, a well-coached team with a, you know, I mean, they've got some serious question marks on offense, no question about it, but that defense is good enough to kind of keep them in games this year, especially in an interesting division like the NFC North. But at, I really do expect it to come down to those two, uh, the two out of the three final matchups there, the Lions-Vikings in Week 16 and then Week 18. I mean, I really think those two games will decide that. I don't expect the Vikings to win 12 or 13 games again. I think it's going to be a 8, 9, 10 win slugfest for this division. MLive.com's Ben Raven with us. Ben, great to see you. Yeah, thank you. You got it. There he is, Ben Raven, with us here. Lions mini camp begins tomorrow. We'll have a Tuesday edition afterwards of Locked On Lions. We'll see you tomorrow.